Hello everyone, welcome. Welcome to today's session. I'm looking at the chat here. I can see lots of people already. Hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope that you're doing well and welcome to today's session with us, Macmillan Education and Mondadori Education for Macmillan Education Time. Hello, hello, I can see lots of people. Where are you writing from? Tell me. Uh, hi, hi everyone. All right, I just would like to remind you that this is a series of webinars where you can get your certificates. Oh, right, I can see people writing from different cities, different regions, fantastic. Oh, I am I live close to Saronno, actually. <laughs> so very, very nice from all over Italy. I'm so happy. Um, okay, so I just wanted to uh, remind you and give you some information and details about this session. Um, as I was saying, you can get your certificates and uh, the certificates will be available uh, on the website in the section attestati, so mondadorieducation.it slash attestati, starting from right after the session. I just remind you that in order to get the certificate, you need to be registered and we will accept registrations until midnight, today at midnight. Um, in, in terms of um, slides, are they are usually available uh, after the, the sessions, but I, we will talk about that later as well. And before welcoming our speaker, I would like to um, remind you and to uh, give you some details on uh, a nice uh, a series of events that we are going to do face to face this year, and they are the Macmillan Days. Now, if you can see the uh, the uh, leaflet over here, the um, topic will be ready for my future from social emotional learning to learner agency. And uh, here over here, you have all the uh, the dates. The first one will be on the 21st of February in Padova. And then there will be Ancona, Torino, Milano, Firenze and Napoli. So, um, if you go to the website, Mondadori Education website, you will be able to see all the information and you will be able to register. Now, without further ado, I would like to welcome our uh, speaker for today, Neil. Hello. Hello. Um, so hi. Hello. Hi. How are things? Hi, how, are you? How, are, how is it going? All good? Really well, thank you. I'm absolutely Fantastic. delighted to be with you here today and with all of our colleagues from all over Italy and possibly even from elsewhere. elsewhere. Absolutely, so, uh, yes. So thanks for being today. here today, Neil. And um, so I'm going to um, disappear in a second so that Neil will be able to introduce himself and uh, give you an idea of the session. But I just wanted to um, present and say that you're going to speak about micro learning with Neil Harris, there is, uh, he's been one of our collaborators for ages now, and we are so happy <laughs> to, to work with him. So enjoy the session. I will be here uh, if you have any questions, and in the end, we are going to meet again. So Thank you very much indeed for those you. kind words, Romina. And uh, as they say, siamo pronti. Via. No <laughs> okay. Thank you very much indeed. It's a real pleasure to be with you all here this afternoon. And as Romina has already mentioned, we're looking at this concept of micro learning. And I'd like to begin straight away uh, by reassuring you that if the term micro learning is relatively or perhaps even completely new to you, please don't worry. It was um, relatively new to me uh, until quite recently. But I also want to link this topic of micro learning to the emergence of the current 
type of learner that many of you are dealing with in the classroom, Generation Z, and increasingly in the future, Generation Alpha. To give you a bit of background information regarding my context, I am one of the academic directors and I'm also director of teacher training at a language school called Kelt, Centre for English Language Teaching in Cardiff. Our learners are from 13 to 17 in our junior centre, and they are 18 and above, in fact, 17 and above in our adult centre. I tell you this because just as you, as educators in Italy, are seeing changes in the profile of your students, I'm seeing it in the way in which the students at our school behave, their expectations, their behaviour. And I think, therefore, having that direct experience is something that I can share with you today. And more importantly, with the facility of chat, you can share with me and each other. Just to therefore give you an idea of what it is we'll be looking at this afternoon, I'm going to begin by giving you some of the definitions and characteristics of micro learning. I then want to look on at this idea of how we profile learners, those from Generation Z, Generation Alpha and more. And the more refers to us, their teachers, because we come from different generations. We come with different learning expectations, which may at times be at odds with the expectations, the desires of our students. I'll then talk briefly about micro learning in ELT before looking at its application, and that will be the majority of this afternoon's webinar, in a ELT Young Learner course book called Upskill. And to demonstrate how this course book and the various digital components that go with it make a very good attempt at uh, a successful attempt at integrating the characteristics of the Generation Z learner and micro learning. But I also want to make it very clear that even if you're not using Upskill, there are clear opportunities for you to be integrating some of the points that we'll be looking at together this afternoon into your own teaching, even with other course books. So <clears throat> it's worth asking the question, what do we mean by micro learning? I was at a conference uh, a couple of months ago at the British Council in London. I, I work extensively with the British Council. And I asked some UK counterparts if they were familiar with the term micro learning. And they both sort of shrugged their shoulders and said, not sure. And I shared that same sense of diffidence. So in putting together this webinar for you this afternoon, it's been an opportunity for me to reflect on the Generation Z and in the future Generation Alpha learner and how we need to be thinking about how they both create and consume content. Now, as the word micro learning or micro reprendimento suggests, the micro has this idea of a very small element Where's my hang on? It's over here. It's a very small scale, short piece of learning. Learning, I think, itself is something that doesn't need a definition. So what we're talking about is this acquisition of knowledge, study, experience, whatever it is that's being taught, but in small bite size chunks. And this idea of the bite size chunk will keep coming up in today's webinar. So here I have an apple. And if I bite into my apple, I've immediately got a bite-sized chunk. I'm not going to <laughs> I'm not going to choke on it. It's small enough to be edible for me. We have this joke in English: how do you eat an elephant? Because of course, elephants are really big. Well, you eat it in bite-sized chunks. And this is the core of micro-learning learning that is designed from the ground up to be delivered in these small chunks. But as we'll see, there is more to it than that. So in finding out more about micro learning, I uh, looked at some of the, the sources and you can see here on screen 
three definitions. And I'm going to just pause at this point just to give you time to read the three definitions for yourselves. I don't want this to be death, uh, death by PowerPoint. And of course, if you have any questions at any time, please feel free to put them into chat. But just a bit of reading time for you now. As I read and thought about these definitions, what occurred to me is this. From the first one, Torgerson 2016, talks about a piece of learning that can be consumed in no more than five minutes. Let's not get too worried about the number here. Five isn't the issue. It's a small, self-contained piece of learning. Maybe it's three minutes. Maybe it's six minutes. It certainly won't be that much longer. In the second one, Notice this idea of people wanting to study any time and any place. And this speaks to the digital nature, the digital accessibility of micro learning and why the digital component is going to be increasingly important for our learners. It's short, it's simple, it's engaging. But notice for those people who might at this point be a little bit sceptical, it's one that allows for deeper encoding, reflection and practice retrieval. It's not about superficial uh, bite-sized chunks where the students don't really get to engage deeply. It's the very opposite when it's done well. Then the third one looks at the fact that this isn't so much about course or curriculum level, but it's looking at these really almost self-contained, time-restricted learning activities. And this is important because in designing micro-learning, particularly if you want to do so yourselves, it's not just about taking existing learning materials and squeezing into five minutes. Rather, it's actually about designing in those bite-sized chunks from the start. So it's perhaps useful to consider what microlearning isn't. Well, it isn't new. Flashcards are in themselves. Where students write a flashcard, we know from the latest research that writing one by hand, but giving st students guidance on what to write is actually something that's been around for hundreds of years, and it is highly effective. Five minutes revision, practice retrieval of vocabulary is extremely important for vocabulary learning. It is not a complete ecosystem. It's not the whole course. It goes back to that third point. It's an individual, it's a set of individual short chunks of learning. Nor is it a library. You may well have longer activities within the curriculum, but the curriculum itself will be articulated through a combination of different activity types, some of which are short and bite-sized. It won't work for everything, but what we see in Upskill is where it's, I think, used very successfully and very well. This next bullet point, existing longer learning divided up into bite-sized chunks. No, it's not about taking a textbook and going five minutes, five minutes, five minutes it's actually designing from the ground up. If we want to think about a grammar activity in a flipped classroom scenario, can we create a short, impactful video for our students to watch on the bus on the way home, in their, in their bedrooms in the evening, just to prime them for something else that happens in classroom the next day? Nor is it about knowledge banking. This idea from Freire, the pedagogy of the oppressed. It's not about just giving students more and more knowledge, which they put into the bank to show what they know. It's about changing behaviour. It's about meeting student expectations and encouraging good performance. And finally, it's not a shortcut. I think what we'll see with micro learning is that it works best with declarative knowledge. 
it, it enables the students to access information, which they can then use and process. Um, it's also, I think, good for, um, for conceptual knowledge, because in fact, micro learning originally came from the world of work. So <clears throat> to try and kind of put this all together, an instructional unit, something that teaches you something, that provides a short engagement to five, six minutes in an activity intentionally designed to elicit a specific outcome from the participant, which may be better understanding of a grammar rule or practice of vocabulary. So in terms of its characteristics, it is essentially digital. And that's why, as we will see later in the presentation today, we've got lots of snippets from Upskill from the digital uh, the hub that is available for Mondadori. Um, it comes from the domain of instructional design. It's an application of an Fatima has written this, and thank you, Fatima, for sharing this in chat. She says, it's the only possible approach considering today's learner's capacity of attention and concentration. So it's thinking about good instructional design that meets the expectations and the skills of the learners. It's distributed over time. It's not something you do one day and you never do again in the future. The learning is punctuated with these short bite-sized chunks. And it's not just about language learning. It was used very effectively in India to help people with type 2 diabetes to understand the management of their uh, particular condition. Whilst it is often appreciated, no, it's not it's often associated with workplace learning, um, with elements of gamification. So if you've ever used something like Duolingo, where you might do a short activity of five, six minutes, you get points, you're competing against other people, and there's a kind of a game interface. That is actually all about micro learning. But it should also be fun, because what are, we want our students to enjoy learning English. And ideally, as much as possible, learning should be made to feel incidental or indirect. And we'll see how that works, for example, with a karaoke later on in the session today. And last of all, it should promote effective recall of learning. If you ever try to get your students to remember vocabulary they've learnt and you've used things like Kahoot, then you'll know just how powerful these short five, 10 minute quizzes are in helping students to review and retrieve vocabulary. So that's micro learning in a nutshell. What about learners? Well. When talking to Romina, in fact, about this presentation a couple of weeks ago, she made the point, our students live in another world. And I think she was making a comparison there between her generation and much older still, my generation. And so this image here is taken from an Australian website, mccrindle.com, and it shows the different demographic groups originally used by advertisers in order to segment and decide how to sell things. But it increasingly has been used to look at the way in which people learn. So today we're going to be looking at Generation Z and Generation Alpha, but you can probably find yourself somewhere here between, I would imagine, Generation Y, Generation X, might even have some baby boomers amongst you um, who are teachers, because what we expect in terms of a leadership style, and that does reflect in the dynamic of teacher students in the classroom, but also the learning style. Notice the generation alpha, an expectation of the visual, whereas generation Z expected, expected the multimodal, not just a book, but other elements as well. Generation Y, interactive learning, all the way back to the builders who expected the teacher to stand at the front of the class and teach them. So I thought it would be useful to have a look at the characteristics of Generation Z and also the characteristics of Generation Alpha, the 13-year-olds who are going to start becoming more and more common in our classrooms. 
Before I show you the next slide, I'd therefore like you, please, to put into chat some keywords that characterize, in your view, the behavior of Generation Z. And that is students aged between 13 and 28. So if you've got 13, 14, 15 year olds and you think about how they learn, what are your expect? What, how would you characterize them? Do they sit down and do they study their books very seriously? What about their attention span? How do they feel about interacting with their peers? What are the big issues for them? In chat, please, how would you characterize, characterize Generation Z? And I'll just pause here for a few moments uh, whilst you put in some answers. As you're thinking, and at the point where you're starting to respond, and we've got some answers coming in already, hyperactive, not concentrated. So this kind of, you know, the mind's going everywhere. I think this comes down to short attention span. That's interesting. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Loredana. Shallow. That's interesting. Thank you for that. Is it shallow or is it a difference? Um, I'm not sure if you mean shallow learning or shallow thinking, or be interesting, Cloud, if you can perhaps expand on that a, bit, a little bit. Need immediate feedback. So again, we're coming back to this sense that, you know, uh, thank you, Donatella, for that, that these, you know, the students, everything's got to be quite quick fire. Difficulty in keeping focus, the corollary of um, a short attention span. Learn only what they like. That's interesting. Selective, okay. Some really nice answers coming in. I'm going to show you now um, information that's come in, um, which comes from the Stanford News. So from a good, reputable academic university background. Um, so we've got their date of birth. They're 13 to 28 years old. In terms of their characteristics, highly digitally communicative, collaborative and social, wanting to communicate with one another but efficient, well-educated, entrepreneurial, may question the status quo. So gone are the days where the teacher just stood up and got automatic respect. Respect needs to be earned. Care deeply about others, value diversity and finding their own unique identity. Those old rigid systems of looking at society and gender they're going out of the window. Um, monitor addicted Antonella. I think that fits in with the highly digitally communicative. Low self-confidence in speaking in a foreign language, low self-esteem. It's probably true of teenagers for over many years. Um, but I think what's interesting with Generation Z is that we can perhaps capitalize on the digital uh, preferences that they have for helping them in terms of developing their speaking. Um, so in terms of their relationship with IT, they've always known the internet. Email and Facebook, ah, they've gone. Snapchat and Instagram is where it's at. Memes and emojis as a communication tool, extensive use of mobile devices. Perhaps comes back to Antonella's point about mobile addicted. But I also think we need to consider them not as negatives, not what can't they do compared with what we can do, but how are they different? So there is this word that goes around snowflakes. Oh, they don't like working hard. It's actually, I don't think that is the case at all. Rather, their worldview is not the same as ours. But whoever said that our worldview was correct in the first place? They're often highly successful in the new domains. That's why in terms of social influence, and we will see social influences coming up again shortly in this presentation, that these are the new, I suppose they're the kind of the it girls of the 1990s and the 2000s. 
Generation Alpha, just to perhaps a preview of what may change as we move from Gen Z, Gen Z to Gen Alpha. And remember, these are students who were born approximately 2010 onwards. So, you know, from today all the way back to around 2010. Like Generation Alpha, highly communicative, collaborative, they're even more globally connected than we were. So I think this is why publishers, there's a lovely um, course book series for teenagers called Gateway. Uh, I don't know if any of you use it, but Gateway to the World actually has collaborative classroom projects where students can link up within the eco structure of the course book platform with schools in other countries. And I think that speaks to this global minded, connected um, identity that is true of Gen Z, but even more so of Generation Alpha. Here we've got it, that short attention span, and also the independence. Double-edged sword, perhaps. Independence in terms of, I want to find out how to do this for myself. I don't need you, teacher, to tell me, which can be seen as a positive, but also to some of us, perhaps, mistakenly, not as a threat to us. But that might how be as we perceive it. End devices. Tablets, mobile phones, much more important than ever. AI is going to be a game changer. For many of them, they will have not known a society without AI. Um, so this, but also this sense of a diversity is even stronger. But also thinking about some social issues. It's no uh, coincidence that an interest in the environment and a passionate concern around the climate crisis is something that is typical of these young learners. And this is why we're seeing so much more work coming into the ELT classroom, looking at issues of the climate crisis. I've just finished a product with the British, a project with the British Council, teaching che teachers in Vietnam how to integrate climate crisis education into the language classroom. So, <clears throat> moving on, we've seen what micro learning is. We've thought about the characteristics of our learners. What about micro learning in our specific domain of ELT, English language teaching? Well. It is, as I've indicated already, relatively unusual. If you actually do a, um, a Google search, you're not going to find a lot out there unless you widen the search to micro learning in general. And what we see is that in ELT, where it is starting to be used, so you are, um, you know, you're on that trail, <laughs> you're at the forefront of this by attending today's webinar. What we're looking at is from the background of instructional design. In other words, thinking about how these students learn, and what, the, what are the materials and what are the methods that will help them to achieve their academic goals? In other words, we're not saying you have to learn like we do. We're saying we recognize how you're different and therefore let's consider how we can make learning fit your preferences, your needs, your worldview. And that's really what the rest of this afternoon's webinar is going to be about. So it's this development of learning resources, which meet the needs and expectations of the new generations of learner. So what does that look like? Well, it looks like this. Um, <clears throat> stick a Y into chat if you're already using Upskill, please. If you're not using it, nothing in chat, but just a why if any of you are using it. Um, it's a Macmillan three-level series, and it's incorporated elements of micro-learning into its ecosystem in terms of the delivery of certain types of learning activity. I've mentioned already the importance of the digital side of things. So not surprisingly, a lot of the contents of Upskill are available digitally. And we'll see integration with external digital tools like Kahoot and YouTube in the next few moments. Um, as you can see here, this is for the third level. 
uh, levels one and two are lower. There's an exam section, so you can see how it links to Invalsi. There's a lovely visual organizer, more of that later, plus the uh, integrated digital contents, plus other information like the teacher's book and the workbook and the answers for teachers in the contenuti per docente. Um, <clears throat> some people, when they see technology, sometimes think, OK, so where's the English language learning going on? So I thought it was useful just to kind of show you what's old as well as what's new. So we're not losing the comprensione orale or the comprensione scritta. So the reading, the listening, the writing, plus the produzione e interazione orale, they're all there, as is, of course, the produzione scritta. You'd expect a language course book to have functional language, and here they are, funzioni, what to say when you meet new people. Plus, of course, our friends' grammar, vocabulary. But here we're beginning to see some of those 21st century skills, cultura e cittadinanza, plus, of course, pronunciation. If I move on, we're beginning to see some of these transferable skills, the competenze traversarli. Notice mediation comes in, a new element that people are getting more and more interested in as a result of its development within the CEFR. Critical thinking, life skills, exam strategies, and the ability to monitor your own learning. But I think here is where the micro learning really comes to the fore. Notice just how many videos. If any of you are quicker at maths than I am, you can perhaps add the number of videos that appear here in total. Vocabulary, storylines, function in English. That's what, it, that's what everyday English is in this particular course. Ah. 30 video rules di grammatica, 21 videos functions, real world speaking, cahoots, ready loaded, that's a time saver for teachers, and the karaoke's. So let's, um, let's have a look. So as I was looking at the books, the first thing that struck me, because I always start by looking at the contents page, was just how Gen Z, Generation Z friendly, these course books are. Remember what we said about this sense of community and of collaboration. So this is level one, level two, level three. Communities, relations, right there at the beginning of level one. Interacting, level two. Level three, I thought this was interesting. Fair future and friendly tech. So this sense of fairness, of equity, of diversity and equality is actually a topic in the course book. So whereas, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, you'd open your headway, you'd open whatever course book, you'd see things like going to the cinema, my favourite film, my favourite pastime. Things are moving on. What we are seeing is, is an increasing visibility of topics which relate to the student's worldview. And of course, it's essential, isn't it? I've just come off a webinar for the British Council where we're talking about anticipating classroom problems. And one of the problems was that the material just doesn't suit the students. And the solution was find topics that relate to the student's real world. And I think we've got them here. But then we start getting into the fun digital stuff. Uh, Massimiliano, get ready. <laughs> so here we've got, um, sorry, Massimiliano, that was a false call. I do this bit. So Kahoot. I'm sure we're all familiar with Kahoot. Kahoot is a lovely way of revising vocabulary. But my experience is, is that as a teacher, at the end of the day, you take your course book, you look at it and you think, OK, what vocabulary do I want to review. Which words am I going to choose? And it all just takes a bit of time. So what I particularly liked about um, Upskill is, in fact, the cahoots are ready made. So if I can only make this work correctly, bear with me one second, everyone. I'm just going to um, move here. Is this going to work? 
Right. Yes. Fantastic. So what I'm going to do now is just click on start. You can see here that the Kahoot is ready made for you. You've got volume one, unit one, playing classic mode, up to 40 students. So, you know, those larger classes, they're catered for. It's an interactive presentation. It includes assessment for learning. All I need to do is schiacciare, it will start, and it comes up ready to join. Because of time limitations, I don't want to actually um, play the Kahoot. So I'm going to come back to the webinar presentation itself, if I can only get my mouse to work. I'm just going to come out of that. And I'm going to come back, there we go, into the presentation itself. You might be asking yourselves the question, well, OK, well, that's nice. So what? So what I think is that the, what we see here is the integration of digital elements, gaming, gamification. And you remember at the beginning of the presentation where we talked about not surface level learning, but deeper learning and retrieval practice. It's all built in for you. It's basically a teacher time saver, plus a valuable methodological element for the learners. Um, moving on, grammar. Now, I invite you to take a look at this page. And I think you'll agree there is nothing particularly um, unusual about it. We've got some examples of the language here. The students then fill in the gap with the correct tense name. There's then a choose the right option. The students then match the time um, expressions with the two verb forms that they're looking at. There's then a complete the sentences and then question form. OK, all relatively standard, except for this intriguing little pink box up here called video. And this is where I'm going to hand over to my colleague Massimiliano as we're going to watch um, a few moments from the next slide where we can actually see this video in action. So Massimiliano, if you're there, if you can start playing the video for us, please. Do you remember the present simple? Mila watches TV in the evening. To make the present simple, we use subject plus verb. We use the present simple to talk about habits, routines, things that are generally true, facts. But what is Mila doing at this exact moment? Mila is watching TV at the moment. We call this the present continuous. To make the present continuous, we use subject plus to be plus verb plus ing. We use the present continuous to talk about things that are happening at the moment of speaking, temporary situations. Let's compare how we use the present. Thank you, Massimiliano. So what you can see there is a video. And if you notice the counter across the bottom, it's about five minutes long. So what are you thinking? Well, I think this is actually a profound but relatively simple game changer. For those of you interested in the flipped classroom, which came out of America and out of science lessons, you'll be familiar with this idea that the teaching happens for homework, where the students watch a video, incidentally, at home. They familiarize themselves with the content so that when they come into class, they've already got some kind of initial idea of what they're studying, and then they can workshop and practice it in the class. So rather than kind of that rather passive teacher teaches the rule, the students already have seen it. I think the FIP classroom, whilst it perhaps doesn't make massive differences to learning outcomes, students tend to learn with or without the FIP classroom. 
For me, the benefit is I can actually get in with my students and spend more time helping them if they're working in small groups, uh, buzz groups around the classroom, and they're maybe trying to do a gap fill activity, the activities that we saw previously, but they go straight into them if they've seen the video beforehand. Admitted, you need to make sure that the students have seen the video. So some teachers might actually prefer just to play this at the beginning of the class, for example. But it does speak to the digital, short, sharp kind of, let's just watch this, five minutes. So that's the video content for grammar. Let's move on and see what else is available in terms of micro learning uh, in this particular program. Before I do, can I just add one thing? M many of you may not be using Upskill at the moment. Well, that's fine. I think if you use Canva, if you're familiar with that, or even just PowerPoint, you would be able to make a five minute video similar to this in about 20 minutes with a bit of practice. And if you have a school virtual learning environment, maybe something simple like Google Classrooms, you could be uploading these micro learning videos yourself and creating your own content. And I know a lot of teachers who are getting more and more into this way of thinking. Of course, with Upskill, you don't even have to do that preparation. It's already done for you. Remember when we were looking at Gen Z and Gen Alpha, the importance of the social elements? And this is something I've not seen anywhere else, is the um, interactivity, or rather the integration of um, social media influences into an English language course book. And I think the first one, Davide Patron, if you're familiar with him, is particularly interesting. So as you can see, um, focus on everyday English, um, language of authentic daily use, evident within every unit and consolidated in videos from two social media young influences, Davide Patron and Elena from Speedy Languages, who are active on principle on the main social media uh, platforms and are close to the reality of the students. Um, I'd like to say nothing more yet, but just as we move on to the next slide, um, Massimiliano, if you can do your magic, please, and we'll just watch uh, a minute or so of Davide. And I think you might be quite interested and even surprised by what you see. Um, so, Massimiliano, over to you for the video. Everyday English. Forse conosci già le espressioni, lucky you, it's fine, you're joking, right? Ma per le stesse ti do delle alternative. Beata te, lucky you. Ma al posto di lucky possiamo usare anche jammy. Questa è da usare con gli amici. You're so jammy. Sei così fortunata. Va bene. It's fine. Ma per rispondere ad una domanda puoi usare anche Sounds good. Do you want to go to the beach? Yeah, sounds good. Stai scherzando, vero? You're joking, right? Oppure you're kidding, right? Aspetta. Puoi dire hang on, hang on, o hold on, hold on. Bella lì. What I thought was really interesting is the multilingual turn that we hear there. Um, Davide is an extremely interesting role model for the Gen Z, Gen Alpha generation, because you might be interested to learn that, in fact, if the information about him online is true, he actually hated learning English until he was about 13 or 14. He's a young kid from Italy with a strong Italian accent who moved to uh, the UK to do a degree in, I think it was the, equi the equivalent of Economia Commercio. I would not be able to say by listening to him that he was anything other than a genuine bilingual. And I think for students, and some of you were talking about, you know, getting students to the point where they feel comfortable learning English. This short video, I think, is really reassuring because they hear someone who they're aware of from social media, he's an influencer, but they can perhaps also um, identify with and aspire to, given that you know he's gone through the same journey as them, but he's also sharing with them genuinely 
useful everyday functional language. Um, we have something similar. I'm not going to play the video on this one because of time. There are other things I'd like to show you. But um, you'll be able to find, actually, on YouTube, if you put in Everyday English with Eleanor, you should be able to find Eleanor doing something very similar. Notice the topic here. You can be part of the climate solution, very much a topic at the heart of our students of today. Instead, I want to move on to look at karaoke. And um, for the purposes of that, yes, it's uploaded. Fantastic. This is something I've never seen anywhere else before. So <clears throat> I think the easiest thing to do is if I um, just start off by playing the karaoke for you right from the beginning. Hopefully this will work OK. Now, you might immediately be saying, well, hang on, why is that karaoke? They're not singing a song. This is where the gamification element comes in. So you can do various things. You can, for example, hide the, the text. Um, you can disactivate and activate the text. You also have control over what you can see and what you can hear. What's the purpose of this? This is drilling for Generation Z on steroids. We all know that generation, sorry, we all know that drilling is really, really good for giving students confidence and automaticity. If you repeat something and you say it often enough, you can get your mouth around it. But it is a bit dull. But what if you divide the class into four groups? One quarter are Harry, one quarter are Emily, one quarter are Oliver, one quarter are Alaya. The students look at the screen, they read, they listen. Second time, they read, they listen, they repeat. Third time, they do it again. Fourth time, you individually start hiding bits of the text. Can the students reproduce in a meaningful way what they've been listening to? So I think two things are happening here. This is working with pronunciation. This is working also with the meaning form relationship, but also what the students are aiming to do is to continue the conversation. So when they get to the end of the conversation, they've completed all of the terms. So it's not just form focused, but it is meaning focused as well. And as I say, I've never seen anything like this before. I think it looks great fun. Be interested in the comments to see if you have any thoughts yourselves. So, yes, as the teacher's book tells us, it's for, it's for uh, practicing comprehension and pronunciation. But the karaoke machine and the engaging repetition engages the students in these new ways. But as I start to draw to a conclusion, I also wanted to say the other thing that I really liked about this course is also its methodological currency. Um, as, a, as a teacher trainer working for Macmillan, Mondadori, uh, Hoover, um, a Greek publisher, Betsis, plus the British Council, it's important for me to see that course materials actually are methodologically sound. What I really liked, and again, it's something I see very rarely, is this use of visual organizers. Now, we know that in terms of the demonstration of learning within an, effect, within an assessment for learning framework, getting students to actually create something, an infographic, a picture, um, a list even, is a way of demonstrating that learning takes place. So here in the um, additional supplements for uh, Upskill that are available on the digital platform, you get these visual learning tools for both vocabulary, as we might expect, but also grammar. Notice there is, there are question forms, some and any, how many, prepositions of place. And of course, as we've seen from those young influences, the functional English as well. So 
effectively, what we have is, I think, not only a very interesting approach to working with young learners and their current characteristics, Generation Z and Generation Alpha, but a beginning, the first attempt, really, of any course book to integrate micro-learning from the ground up. Remember, grammar videos, the karaoke's, the social influences and the topics, plus latest learnings from methodology in terms of visual learning uh, as evidences of, effect, of effective assessment for learning. So that brings me to the end. We have a few moments left before the end for any uh, questions that you may have. But can I thank you all so much for your engagement already in chat and let the questions begin. Hi, hi Romina. Hi, I'm back. <laughs> thanks, thanks Neil for this fantastic uh, session. I really enjoyed it, I, I have to say, but I was reading the comments and everyone was saying the, that they really enjoyed uh, all the parts. And to be honest, um, I can see some comments saying that, for example, someone is using already karaoke, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, they um, uh, they were saying also, okay, is it possible to get the recording of the webinar? Um, everything will be available in the um, in the section on the Mondadori website, so you will be you, you will receive everything with the slides as well. Uh, okay, so I can see lots of thank you. And actually, um, I have to say that these are uh, nice tips because micro learning um, is not really easy to uh, to utilize on a daily basis, maybe because uh, we tend usually we tend to follow the books, right? Mm. Or to say, I have to prepare them for the exams or I have to uh to organize my time so uh micro learning can really save time actually but we yeah. we might not be um so we might not rely on it so much so it's really nice to have this kind of approach um and i think you mentioned exam preparation there is often a fear isn't there with teachers that kind of they've got the desire to teach the language and the culture and yet there's this exam hurdle, which they can't ignore. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I noticed, I mean, I was talking to some teacher trainers about three, four years ago before Invalsi actually was validated. It was on its way. Um, and I believe I'm right in saying that, in fact, there's a whole section on the digital platform that is linked to exam preparation that includes Invalsi. So in terms of having something that is Gen Z friendly, I've turned American there, Generation Z. <laughs> <laughs> but also having that um, that wider holistic element. But it seems to me that Upskill really does provide a lot um, there for the busy teacher. Um, and yes, as you say, also, um, I'm hoped at what I was able to do today in demonstrating some of the characteristics of Upskill was make the point that even if you're not using that course book, you can still learn from it in terms of thinking, can I take the grammar page, I'll, I'll copy it in, I'll do a photocopy of it, I'll put it onto um, PowerPoint, and I'll make my own video. Or better still, get your students you to make to do that. Video. Best way for students to learn a grammar point is to take the challenge of teaching it to one another. Absolutely. It's time, but it's a wonderful activity. You know, they really feel agency at that point. They want to understand the grammar because they want to have made the best video um, of the class. So there's another idea for you. Yeah, absolutely. That's that. That's a nice one. And I have to say that, uh, for example, I've got two nieces, uh, and they are Gen Z, one hundred percent. So uh, they would love studying through videos, for example, because they are yes. always, they are so used to, to TikTok and Instagram reels, et cetera, yes. et cetera. So um, it's something that, why not? We could also exploit during our lessons to, yeah. to, to, to increase motivation, definitely. 
All right, so uh, thank you very much, everyone. I can see some uh, final comments. So thank you, you are fantastic and motivating. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'm eager to try this methodology. I'm so, right. so good happy luck. Lola too. <laughs> exactly, good yeah. luck and let us know how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> and Mm -hmm. But I mean, for anyone who's interested in finding out a little bit more about upskill, what would they do to to get more information? Absolutely. Where do they think? Um, so in you can always have a look at mondadorieducation.it website. And if you have, I'm sure you, you do, but if you have your local agent uh, that you are talking to, they can bring you copies as well. And I am available as well. Now I cannot unfortunately put my um let me see if i can maybe through here if i can put my email address in the chat box so if you need or if you have any uh queries about the book i can help you so if you can't see it it's okay. .com. Yes, exactly. Now you you can see it in the in the comments because our ah. colleagues added it. Ah, so um, thank you again. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, do have a look at the section attestati on mondadoreducation.it website because you will find that uh, you'll find those there. And um, uh, am I also like, sorry? There's a question that's come in from Antonella. If I've understood correctly that uh, teachers have until midnight to sign up for this in order to receive the recording. Is in that right? In order to receive it, exactly, exactly. Uh, oh, thank you. I, I did. A, I I was missing that one. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Okay. Cool. I'm just thinking the best. So, um, they're surely motivating strategies. Generations that get soon tired of many things. Yeah, variety. Um, don't fall into the trap of having a short video every Tuesday, second lesson. It'll become a routine. Switch it around. Karaoke one week, Kahoot regularly for vocabulary review. Get the students sometimes to re re make the Kahoots for you. Focus in on them. Just think of ways of doing the same thing, but in slightly different ways to give that sense of variety. I've gone on for too much already. No, no, that's the, these Definitely. are all great ideas. Thank you. So thank you, everyone. And uh, I hope to see you soon in our next session. Uh, so have a look at the website. There's the whole program there. And thank you, Neil, again for, for this session. Thank you, everyone. A big thank you to you. But can I also say a big thank you to Alessandro and to Massimiliano, who are in the background. Absolutely. Without them, this really would not have gone as well as it did. So, Alessandro. <laughs> Piano, grazie tante. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone, and enjoy your afternoon. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye bye.